morning. I wonder if you have ever felt like that no matter how how hard you try, things seem to consistently not go your way. I wonder if you've ever found yourself feeling as though you just keep coming up short. Anyone relate with that? You know, you wake up and you see the sun, though not today, at least not yet. You feel the sun on your face and things seem to be looking up and then you turn the corner and you see the rain clouds looming just on up ahead and as you can you relate to this as you look around you you feel not only alone but you don't even have an umbrella i think we've all been there before when you feel like you you get it going and then as quickly as you get it going something out of nowhere seems to sidestep your steps you take one step forward And then it feels as though you take 2,000 steps backwards. I think Moses, I presume Moses felt this way at this moment in the story. He has finally come to this place of obedience, finally saying, okay, God, I will go. And he begins the journey back to Egypt. He has agreed to let God's will be his will and so he does a quick stop off to talk with his father-in-law Jethro he packs up the family and 40 years of life and he begins the trek across the hot desert terrain and mid journey Moses quickly comes to the realization of this very truth the right thing would you agree with this church the right thing is often the very hard thing Exodus chapter 4, if you have your Bible with you. When we last journeyed with Moses, he was en route to Egypt. Astonishingly, we see he is about to die. And we hit pause there, and we celebrated our three churches yesterday. Yesterday, last Sunday, it feels like it was just yesterday. Uh, Thank you to all of you who are helping bless churches around the world by supporting churches three and one right here. We're so excited. I was excited to hear the announcement that Kristen made to be able to bless those churches. So we celebrated them last week. We jumped back into where we were two weeks ago, Exodus chapter 4. Look at verse quickly as we recap, and just a reminder as to where we left Moses on the journey. Verse 24, he pauses, Scripture says, at a lodging place on the way, on the way to stand before the Pharaoh. And there the Lord, look at this, the Lord met with Moses this came out of nowhere, and was about to kill him. But Zephora, his wife, took out a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Can't imagine ever hearing this from my wife. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood. Oh, my. She said this. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood. The Lord let him alone, and at this time she said bridegroom of blood, referring to to circumcision. You know, when Moses' wife, Zephora, makes this, this claim and essentially tells her husband how disgusted she is with him, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. It's obvious she's not happy. I mean, circumcision was an act of obedience for the Hebrew, not the Midianite. She is a Midianite. And so this is an act of obedience of which it's obvious she did not want to perform and in doing so, disgusted her what's interesting here is have you paused to consider this she knew exactly what to do and so she jumped in she got the job done and she saved her husband's life this tells me that the two of them Moses and Zephora must have had a conversation about this very act before because she knew of the act and so she she performs the act this act of obedience for the Hebrew And we too see how disgusted she is. And I presume it is in this moment where a realization comes to both of them. Moses knew what was to be done, but rather 
I'm presuming here, than being a, a spiritual leader of the home following God's command to circumcise his son, he instead chose to honor his wife's wishes. And such a decision of disobedience almost cost him his life. Church, Zephora is actually only mentioned one other time to us after the bridegroom of blood incident. We do not know for sure, but it appears as though the two of them live estranged from this moment forward. Moses' wife and children are only mentioned actually one more time in combination. It is clear at a minimum that Moses' children do not rise to a position of authority with the nation of Israel. And it also appears that they do not even travel with Moses anymore as he journeys on to Egypt, nor as his journey continues for 40 years through the wilderness and eventually to the promised land. It appears from this moment forward that Moses journeys on without the support of these family members. How disheartening this must have been for this 80-year-old man. One step forward, 2,000 steps backwards. Now, Moses finds himself in Egypt with no friends. His father-in-law Jethro is not even mentioned at this moment in the story and it appears his family has all but deserted him. And now just as was the case 40 years ago, once again this man finds himself, immerse yourself in this today church, he finds himself once again in the middle of the desert wondering God where are you? Wondering God what's up with my life? I've thought of this story often over the past two weeks as i've considered mine i wonder to church if some of you here today and maybe those watching via our stream have found yourself in such a place as this listen this is very important not being alone because god tells us he's always with us but that that all-consuming thought of feeling alone even when we're not alone we if we allow the situations and circumstances and emotions to overtake us, we can find ourselves feeling very alone, particularly as leaders. You know, leaders, we're going to see in this story, in the life of Moses, that this man is placed in situations where he must make spur-of-the-moment decisions. Leadership, I am seeing in this story, is a position that we often find ourselves in as leaders where we make decisions that others do not understand. Leaders must often do what others will not do. Leaders must often set into motion events that, that even close friends and family do not even understand and often resent and possibly choose to turn on us because of this. It's interesting, people want to follow a leader until the leader leads in a way that brings discomfort to people. We're going to see that with Moses. People want to follow a leader who motivates and inspires but Moses is going to show us, and we're already seeing this, that, that true leadership, particularly in a situation such as this where Moses realizes he's done something wrong and it must be rectified, his wife plays a part. And true leadership, it's about hard choices and circumstances and making decisions involving many, many layers, oftentimes to which others are not privy. Church, I hope that we not be such a church where we, based upon our circumstances, choose to judge leaders who make decisions based upon their circumstances. I hope we are not such a church. Sadly, I have experienced, and I'm sure you have as well in times of leading, that sometimes it's just not easy to lead people in a, in a direction they would rather not go. And people misunderstand, and people judge, and people complain, and people turn. I mean, think about Jesus. He made decisions... Decisions that were right, but two decisions that undeniably placed him at odds with so very many people. And as a matter of fact, his decisions undoubtedly left him with a full understanding of the sting of loneliness. I mean, at one point, in his most difficult hour, because of his decisions, everyone deserted him. So here is Moses. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. He's en route to Egypt. He's taken some pretty big blows... God almost takes his life. He's now journeying alone. But y'all, I believe all of this, this was important that we covered this this morning, though a difficult place to pause. All of this makes what happens next all the more sweet and special for the life of this 80-year-old man. Look at verse 27, the same chapter, Exodus 4. 
the Lord said to Aaron, this is the brother of Moses, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And so he met Moses at the mountain of God. Interestingly, the same places at which God met Moses as the story began in the life of adult Moses. He told him to go and meet with him at the mountain of God. And so he does so and he kisses him there. Look at verse 28. Moses told Aaron everything. As far as I can see, this is the first time Moses has had a conversation telling someone everything that's happened. Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say. And also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. I think it's important, church, that that we pause there. Again, there's so many layers to this story, but God must have known what it was that Moses most needed in this moment. Go back to verse 14 of chapter 4. I'll remind you, God has already told Moses that his brother Aaron was going to be joining him, which we just kind of quickly passed this several weeks ago, but it's an important part of the story, and it, it proves to us that God understands our needs even before We know our needs. Look at verse 14, chapter 4, when God is speaking to Moses. The Lord's anger burned against Moses, it said. And look what he says. What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. And then look what God says. We we moved quickly past this. I knew we would untouch it or unpack it rather later. He is already on his way to meet you. And he would be glad to see you. I find this to be truly amazing, church. Before Moses even knew that he was going to need his brother and that his family was no longer going to journey with him, God knew this. And I have told you over and again how fascinating this story is. There's so so very many special nuggets for us along the way to grab. And church, I hope you don't miss this one. This is such a sweet one. Hands down, this is one of the sweetest ones. And it's a great reminder for us today that God is concerned about my concerns. It's a great take home for us all. God is concerned about my concerns. I find this moment with Moses to just be reassuring and, and, and comforting. And I hope for anyone feeling as though you are journeying alone today, let God's word remind you you're not journeying alone today. But if you find yourself in such a place, I hope that you will receive this today that, again, God is concerned about my concerns. He knows what I'm thinking right now. He knows what you're thinking. If today is a hurt day for you, he understands your hurt. If today is a day of of question marks, or consider this, church, if you have circumstances right now, because this this is how it works for all of us, if we're not careful. Our circumstances fight for attention in our lives. And when our circumstances are painful, they, they fight emotionally to consume us. And so we have to rage against this. That's why we talk so much about getting in the Word and spending time in the Word and getting the Word in us and letting it it, it shape us because our circumstances fight so hard to convince us that God is not involved. Our circumstances fight so hard to, to encourage us to embrace the mantra that God is not real or at a minimum God is at a distance And here we see Moses in this position where seemingly he could be questioning everything again. And God sends Moses' brother to him at the right time. And fascinatingly, God sends Moses' brother to him even though Moses didn't know he needed him. Before Moses was even concerned, because church, you should write this this morning. I don't think I'm going to put it on the screen for you. But God, listen, God is always ahead of our concerns. He is always ahead of our concerns. Whatever your situation or your praying, the prayers that are consuming your life, your brokenness, your loneliness, an internal pain, I hope that you will let God's Spirit consume you. Listen, I hope you will let God's Spirit consume you today with these truths. That that is this, God is working ahead of my pain and God has not left me on my own and God is intimately aware of the lies competing for my allegiance. Because God is concerned about my concerns. And we're going to continue to see this in the story, that God longs to give me what I need. Everybody say, that's right. right. Turn to someone and say, that's right. right. Ask them if they're awake. Say, are you awake this morning? 
We're a little quiet. We're a little down. The sun's not out. I know. This is a good day to be in church. Here's what we have to keep in mind. What I want may not be what I need. What I want may not be what I need. And this is why my prayer, your prayer, must continue to be God where your will be done in my life. Moses doesn't even fully know what he needs, but God knew in this moment. He probably wanted his family to come back. We're going to talk more about that later. Because there's more to that story. We're going to unpack it more in weeks to come. But our prayer must consistently be, God, will your will in my life, in all situations, in all aspects of my life, be done. Look at verse 29. So Moses, he meets with his brother in the wilderness, and it appears that his brother, again, is the first person to whom he shares the entire encounter with God. This must have been a really special reunion for these two brothers and i want you to see what happens next verse 31 by the way very well might be my favorite verse in all the entirety of verses we have unpacked thus far in the from fear to freedom series because it is convicting and it is humbling verses 29 30 and 31 look at this moses and aaron brought together all the elders of the israelites by the way Placing themselves in such a position could have killed them. They're slaves. But they've come together in a secret meeting. Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and they worshipped. And for four, guys, let this sink in, for 400 years, Years, the nation of Israel has been prisoners, prisoners in Egypt. Children and parents and grandparents, they've all, they've all been prisoners, slaves, workers, recipients. We discussed this earlier of, of whips and of beatings. We're going to see the beatings continue today. It's hard for us, I know, here in America to wrap our head, our thoughts around the, the, the idea of brutality and what it means to be a slave to another. That's why we are so thankful, though also mournful on a weekend such as this where we do remember. We're so thankful for those who have served and who have given their lives for us. But it's difficult for us to even consider what it would really be like, the brutality of such. But this was their reality. Every day and every moment they lived as property of the state of Egypt, yet we're, we're seen here in three verses that even admits their pain and their humiliation and their weariness and their fear over being found out to this very meeting. So guys, I want to show you two things here. Scripture tells us that are game changers for our hearts. They're game changers for the nation of Israel. They're simple, but they are powerful acts that are so moving that I, I did not want to pause here. I really didn't. There's so much more to get to in this story. I want to unpack chapter 5 with you, but I, I need to give you quickly two things that I would say are the hope for the church that I see here in these three verses. And the first is this, number one, believe. Everyone say believe. believe. It's truly amazing how three simple words can possess so very much weight. Do you see it in verse 31? And they believed. 400 years. And all that is consuming their lives, just right outside of this, this meeting, the reality, though they are together, Moses, Aaron, and the elders, there's a reality of, of brutality awaiting them. But it says they believe. And that's so convicting to me. And this blessed life that I live and all that has been afforded to me, but yet there's so very many times I just doubt God and His goodness and His faithfulness when my circumstances go south. Remember, this is exactly what God told Moses would happen. Look back at chapter 3 real quickly. That's why we spent so much time unpacking this because there are so many, again, nuggets along the way. God told Moses this would happen. Look at verse 16, chapter 3. Assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I've watched over you. 
I've seen what's been done to you in Egypt, and I promise to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at verse 18. The elders of Israel will listen to you. God told Moses this would happen. And guys, here it happens. The end of chapter 4, how this must have thrilled the heart of this 80-year-old man. God told Moses precisely this would happen. And it did. And I hope this for us. I so hope this for us. That we take God at His word, church. That we just take Him at His word. We don't try to be sexy around here. and We don't try to come up with emotional stories to pull in our heartstrings. We just preach the truth. And this is the truth. That we would grab this and that we would believe it that we would hold on to it because our beliefs shape our choices. Our beliefs shape our convictions. How I believe shapes how I live. It shapes my passions and intuitions. My beliefs shape the way I treat others. My beliefs obviously shape my obedience. How we live is so based upon the foundational truth on what we believe. I hope that we would so... Take God's word that we would look at it, that we would unmistakably count it as truth and that we would not sway from it no matter what culture says is now acceptable in culture, but that we would stay hardline truth to God's word and we would believe it. We would see, therefore, over and over and over again how it changes us. What does it do to us? Well, it's the second word we see. Not only that these people came together, And they believed, but that secondly, the hope for the church I would give you today is then therefore the belief leads to, everyone say this word, worship. That's what it says here. They believed, and when they heard, verse 31, that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery. It doesn't say they got together four or five bullet points as to what's next or answered everyone's questions so that they were all on the same page. No, it just simply says they bowed down. And they worshiped. And how many a church today is so concerned, so concerned about processes rather than being more concerned about worship? So concerned about fill in the blank rather than, as we see here, they bowed down and they worshiped. You know, when we come to a place of, of truly believing in something, of trusting, of, of fully trusting, whatever the something or someone is, that belief has a, a power of motivation that hopefully, as it relates to our belief in God's Word and His truths and His power, that leads us to a heart of gratitude, an exuberance of gratefulness. Because consider this, here we we have these men coming together, these elders, and again, they know what is lurking. They know what reality awaits them post the meeting. But yet even with this monumental task, this uncertainty before them, this really incomprehensible journey they're considering to stand before the king of Egypt and simply say, let us go. They have this challenge, but yet we see here amidst the challenge, they have a heart of of peace. And with such peace, there is an ushering in of worship. Look again at verse 31. True, authentic, selfless, real worship. I don't want us to quickly move past this. They believed. They heard the Lord was concerned about them. And He sees their misery. And they bow down and they worship. There's just so much to that. I know, I know we must move on. Let's do move on. Let's look at chapter 5. I want to read a lot of Scripture to you here, church. We're finally at the moment where Moses stands before Pharaoh. I feel like we should have you know, some music happening here and some lights. You know, just the, the time has come. 
the rock and roll show is on, but you know, the reality is God's word is just fullness enough. We don't need any of that. But I, I'm super excited to finally be here with you. Moses stands before Pharaoh. There is a lot to read here. I, I'm, I'm actually just going to read the entirety of the chapter. I want you to take it in, and then in our, our final time together, I'll give you some thoughts. Verse 1, chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go. I mean, we could do the, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm not going to do that. I've been wanting to do that for 15 weeks. Okay, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? We're going to unpack that next week. That I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. The same day, the same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You were no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt. Just imagine this. To gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them saying, complete the work required of you for each day just as when you had straw. It's an impossible situation. And then look at verse 14. Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding... Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Hmm. Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being bitten, beaten, but the fault is with you, or rather your own people. And Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are lazy that is why you keep saying let us go and sacrifice to the lord now get to work you will not be given any straw yet you must produce your full quota of bricks look at this the israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you were not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day so that look at this they left pharaoh they found moses and aaron i'm sure moses and aaron are anxiously awaiting to hear how the meeting went Verse 21, they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. It's hard to be a leader. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and put a sword in their hand to kill us. So look at what Moses does, how quickly he reverts back to the old Moses. Verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this what you sent me, or is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Remember, God told Moses this would happen. Do you remember this? He told him it would happen. Look at 21, verse 21, chapter 4. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. Look at this. But I will harden his heart. I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. God prepared Moses for exactly this moment. He told him this would happen. He told him this would happen. So guys, let's, 
Let's talk about this for a moment before before we finish today. The obvious question before us, I've asked this question to numerous people this week and I've had, I've received a variety of, of responses. The question here before us, why? Why does God harden the heart of Pharaoh? Have you ever pondered this? You probably have. God, consider it has, He's commissioned Moses. He's called him out of the Midian desert to go stand before the most powerful man on the planet. Again, 400 years of brutality against his chosen people. God empowers Moses to go miraculously speak to him, to speak to Pharaoh, that is, after being empowered as God spoke to Moses through a bush on fire, standing on the mountain of God. A bush ablazed as Moses is standing barefoot. God gives Moses some pretty supernatural tricks up his sleeve. A staff that turns to a snake and back to a staff. A leprous hand. Back to a clean hand. A body of water that turns into blood. God gives Moses all of this and tells him to fearlessly walk into the palace and to stand before the king of Egypt and demand freedom. However, God throws in one twist. By the way, Moses, Pharaoh's going to say no. Surely Moses had to be thinking at one point or the other, what? Wait, what? Did I hear you correctly? Are we, are we really doing it this way? You're telling me after all of this, getting me out of the water and saving me even though I committed murder, and I traveled hundreds of miles away and giving me a wife and a family and a job and the burning bush and The staff and the leprous hand and the bloody water, you're telling me now it's not going to work? Why? Why does God first harden the heart of the king of Egypt? Well, I think this is going to take us a few weeks. In a few weeks, let me just kind of tease you. I will say this. We're going to see in a few weeks that that Pharaoh himself, he's not an innocent party here. He actually hardens his own heart, and we're going to see that. So I just kind of want to throw that out to you in your time of study if you want to read ahead and unpack that and walk through that. That's going to be a part of the story. But we do know, and God makes it biblically clear to Moses, that God first hardens the heart of the king of Egypt. So why? Why? I have a couple of thoughts here, but I will tell you this. I think the why is answered in the words God speaks to Moses. And so I think the next few words are important for us. I hope you'll really, really listen, really listen through this. All that God has given Moses, this most amazing life story, these supernatural things that have happened in the life of Moses. The the amazing already, we could pause the story indefinitely here and spend an eternity unpacking all that God has already done in the life of Moses, and we could say it's amazing. We haven't even gotten to the plagues and the the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments and all that is yet to come in the story. This has been a most amazing story. Yet, church, this is really important. Don't miss this. Even with all the amazing that's already happening, we see that Moses, is, Moses, listen, is still a man bouncing back and forth. Still a man going from trust to fear. From I trust you to are you crazy? From I trust you to what in the world are you doing? To I'm going to trust you. I'm not even sure if you're worthy of me following you. There's this vacillating between trust and fear. I mean, think about it. Look at verse 22 again. As quickly as Moses returns from speaking to Pharaoh, and then from this moment where The Israelite leaders are told also no by the king of Pharaoh. Look at what Moses does. Moses returns, verse 22. And look what he says. Why have you brought trouble on all of us? Can you see him also pointing his finger at God? 
God, what are you thinking? Why, 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 have, why have you done this? And it's obvious Moses is a man still struggling deeply with fully trusting God. So again, why? Why does God harden the heart of Pharaoh? Well, I'm of the belief God hardens Pharaoh's heart for one specific, very important reason that I want to give you today, and that is this, to conform the heart of Moses to align with God's heart. Let me, let me explain. God wants Moses to trust him. Period. Not to trust in circumstances, not to trust in Pharaoh saying yes, not to trust in the staff to a snake and back to a staff, not to trust in these, these miracles or his own abilities or his brother Aaron showing up or even the nation of Israel's elders. God wants Moses to fully trust him. I presume God is using the defiance of Pharaoh to do exactly this. And what God, I'm confident, wants you and me to gain from this story here in our real world in 2024 is this. God desires that my allegiance for him is founded upon my trust in him. Not in what God can do for me, or even what God can do through me. Instead, my allegiance for him is founded upon complete and total adherence to him, the person of God I am. Look at Exodus chapter 6. After Moses returns to speak with the Lord, obviously speaking from this, this posture of fear and this extreme position of distrust in God, look at how God responds to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Verse 1, chapter 6. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Don't miss any of this, church. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. I could put in parentheses here. Moses, not because of your hands or the eloquence of your words or your brother Aaron or the trickery of Staffs to snakes, not because of anything you can do. God said also to Moses in verse 2, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make my myself, my, myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of, the, of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I've remembered my covenant. This is why we spent four weeks studying the covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. Do you notice what he's saying here? He's, he isn't saying, hey, go back and tell Pharaoh. Go to my people and remind them of everything I've already done because of what? Because of who I am. I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched armor with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the God. The Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore uplifted to give to Abraham, to give to Isaac, and to give to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. And God, just to put icing on the cake, says it one more time. I am the Lord. Guys, do you know this is on four occasions? Don't miss this. On four occasions, look at it, on four occasions in these eight verses, God says two words, and the two words are, I am. In verse 2, in verse 6, in verse 7, and in verse 8, God says four times to answer Moses, I am. Exodus 6, 2, God says, I am the Lord. Exodus 6.6, 6, God says, I am the Lord. Exodus 6.7, God says, I am the Lord. Exodus 6.8, God says, I am the Lord. Four times, y'all. Four times God says, I am the Lord. Let me put that in modern day English. What God is saying to Moses, Moses, your focus is in the wrong place. It's not in any accomplishment of your own and it's not even in how the Pharaoh responds your focus is in the wrong place 
And I am calling you to place your focus on me. And so obviously God knows some stuff about Moses' heart we are not privy to. And so he hits pause on Pharaoh's heart because he's still got some business to do with Moses. I hope we don't miss this, y'all. I hope we don't, listen, I hope we don't move past this. I hope we're willing for the pause that God wants to place in our lives, that that's what he's called us to individually and as a church. This is the pattern we see throughout the entirety of Scripture, by the way, where God pauses his people in times of celebration and in times of tragedy to place their eyes on him. Look at Isaiah 6. We know this. The prophet, he's broken over the moral condition, the moral position of his nation. One day it says that he goes out and he looks up into the sky. And here's the answer his heart needs. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is the exact perspective Isaiah needed to continue leading well. And he gets his eyes fixed on the Lord, his entire outlook shifts. It's a great read. In the book of Hebrews, we believe written by Paul on several occasions, has this, though different, wording, exact theme in his wording of proclamation. Look what he says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. Look at what he says. Fix. Everybody say fix. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He goes on in verses 1 of 2 of chapter 12 of the same book. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Doing what? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Church, there's no spiritual guru. There's no number one bestseller. There's no family counselor, no life coach or therapist out there that can, listen, can give you anything better than what it means for you to pause and fix your eyes on what matters. More specifically, on who matters. There is no God substitute, period. And when we choose to fix our eyes on the Lord, our perspective changes. And our hurt and our mess and our discomforts and our brokenness and our disillusionment and our setbacks and our rainy days without umbrellas and our brokenness, and our letdowns, and our losses, and our fragmented dreams, everything, everything, everything we see from a different perspective. After all that God has done for Moses, we see that there is an 80-year-old man still very much in need of learning what it means to fix his eyes on God. What's fascinating is that these words God uses to tell Moses who he is are precisely look quickly at Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 precisely the exact words God uses in their very first meeting and moment on the mountain it's one sentence but it's beautiful God says to Moses in the middle of their conversation around the burning bush I am who I am you know, when you think back of the story of the burning bush in that moment, God, God doesn't talk to Moses about convincing him to be a great leader. He doesn't talk to Moses really about anything he's going to do. God spends the time at the bush simply saying to Moses, trust me, I am. So God knows that this man is a man that has a lot of work, heart work, that needs to be done. And so I believe that God hardens the heart of the king in order to soften the heart of Moses. And so church, I would end with this. Man, there's just so much to this story. God is hardening the heart of Pharaoh in order to draw the heart of the man Moses into complete allegiance of and reliance upon him. So let me just ask you as we wrap, what's that do for you and me? As a matter of fact, three quick questions. Look at the screen. What is God saying to me? 
The screen may not even be working right now. What is God desiring of me? What is God requesting from me? Will you think of these three questions? What is God saying to me? What is God desiring of me? What is God requesting from me? You know, if I could be vulnerable with you, I would tell you that It is these three questions with which I have wrestled this week that have revealed to me areas of my life that are in need of a circumcision, of a cutting away. I think if we're not careful, church, we can be so consumed with trying to find a remedy to life's challenges that we simply miss the hope found in the almighty God I am. And I hope we get better at this. I sure want to. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? You know, the more I've journeyed with Moses, the more I've, I've come to understand just how desiring God is of our complete allegiance to Him. And that God is willing to do whatever is necessary to get our attention. A nation of people 400 years in slavery. People facing brutality unimaginable. But yet we see God's intimate concern about the man Moses. Of course he's concerned of his people. We read that five times in just chapter 5. But we continue to see God's working on a man in his heart. Church, I would encourage you here in the stillness of this moment before we close in worship that you would allow God to work the same on your heart. Whatever he desires, that your prayer would just be, God, your will be done. Father, that is our prayer today. Whatever you desire, your will be done. For your glory. Amen.